Welcome to Madison Public Library in Madison, Ohio's Theater of the Mind, Halloween edition. Tonight we have the third part of a five-night story, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. To hear more stories, like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Last night we left off with a narrator talking about Brom Bones and his gang. And now we return to The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. This rantipole hero had for some time singled out the blooming Katrina for the object of his uncouth gallantries, and though his amorous toyings were something like the gentle caresses and endearments of a bear, yet it was whispered that she did not altogether discourage his hopes. Certain it is his advances were signals for rival candidates to retire, who felt no inclination to cross a lion in his amours, insomuch that when his horse was seen tied to Van Tassel's paling of a Sunday night, a sure sign that his master was courting, or as it is termed, sparking within, all other suitors passed by in despair and carried the war into other quarters. Such was the formidable rival with which Ichabod Crane had to contend, and considering all things, a stouter man than he would have shrunk from the competition, and a wiser man would have despaired. He had, however, a happy mixture of pliability and perseverance in his nature. He was in form and spirit like a supple jack, yielding but tough. Though he bent, he never broke. And though he bowed beneath the slightest pressure, yet the moment it was away, jerk, he was as erect and carried his head as high as ever. To have taken the field openly against his rival would have been madness, for he was not a man to be thwarted in his amours any more than st the stormy lover Achilles. Ichabod, therefore, made his advances in a quiet and gently insinuating manner. Under cover of his character of singing master, he made frequent visits at the farmhouse, not that he had anything to apprehend from the meddlesome interference of parents, which is so often the stumbling block in the path of lovers. Balt Van Tassel was an easy, indulgent soul. He loved his daughter better even than his pipe, and like a reasonable man and an excellent father, let her have her way in everything. His notable little wife, too, had enough to do to attend to her housekeeping and manage her poultry, for as she sagely observed, ducks and geese are foolish things and must be looked after, but girls can take care of themselves. Thus, while the busy dame bustled about the house, replied her spinning wheel at one end of the piazza, Honest Bolt would sit smoking his evening pipe at the other, watching the achievements of a little wooden warrior, who, armed with a sword in each hand, was most valiantly fighting the wind on the pinnacle of the barn. In the meantime, Ichabod would carry on his suit with the daughter by the side of the spring under the great elm, or sauntering along in the twilight, that hour so favorable to the lover's eloquence. I profess not to know how women's hearts are wooed in one. To me they have always been matters of riddle and admiration. Some seem to have but one vulnerable point or door of access, while others have a thousand avenues and may be captured in a thousand different ways. It is a great triumph of skill to gain the former, but a still greater proof of generalship to maintain possession of the latter, for a man must battle for his fortress at every door and window. He who wins a thousand common hearts is therefore entitled to some renown, but he who keeps undisputed sway over the heart of a coquette is indeed a hero. Certain it is that was not the case with the redoubtable Brom Bones, and from the moment Ichabod Crane made his advances, the interests of the former evidently declined. His horse was no longer seen tied at the palings on a Sunday night, and a deadly feud gradually arose between him and the preceptor of Sleepy Hollow. Brom, who had a degree of rough chivalry in his nature, would fain have carried matters to open warfare and have settled their pretensions to the lady according to the mode of those most concise and simple reasoners, the knight-errants of yore, by single combat, but Ichabod was too conscious of the superior might of his adversary to enter the lists against him. He had overheard a boast of bones that he would double the schoolmaster up and lay him on a shelf up his own schoolhouse, and he was too wary to give him an opportunity. There was something extremely provoking in this obstinately pacific system. It left Brom no alternative but to draw upon the funds of rusty wagery, 
in his deposition and to play off boorish practical jokes upon his rival. Ichabod became the object of whimsical persecution to Bones and his gang of rough riders. They harried his hitherto peaceful domain, smoked out his singing school by stopping up the chimney, broke into the schoolhouse at night in spite of its formidable fastenings of lithe and window stakes, and turned everything topsy-turvy so that the poor schoolmaster began to think all the witches in the country held their meetings there. But what was still more annoying, Brom took all opportunities of turning him into ridicule in the presence of his mistress, and had a scoundrel dog whom he taught to whine in the most ludicrous manner, and introduced as a rival of Ichabod's to instruct her in psalmody. In this way, matters went on for some time, without producing any material effect on the relative situations of the contending powers. On a fine autumnal afternoon, Ichabod, in pensive mood, sat enthroned on the lofty stool from whence he usually watched all the concerns of his little literary realm. In his hand he swayed a ferrule, that scepter of despotic power, the birch of justice reposed on three nails, behind the throne a constant terror to evildoers, while on the desk before him might be seen sundry contraband articles and prohibited weapons, detected among the persons of idle urchins, such as half-munched apples, pop-guns, whirligigs, fly-gages, and whole legions of rampant little paper gamecocks. Apparently there had been some appalling act of justice recently inflicted, for his scholars were all busily intent upon their books, or slyly whispering behind them with one eye kept upon the master, and a kind of buzzing stillness reigned throughout the schoolroom. It was suddenly interrupted by the appearance of a negro in toe-cloth jacket and trousers, a round-crowned fragment of a hat like the cap of mercury, and mounted on the back of a ragged, wild, half-broken colt, which he managed with a rope by way of halter. He came clattering up to the school door with an invitation to Ichabod to attend merrymaking, or quilting frolic, to be held that evening at Mynheer Van Tassel's, and having delivered his message with that air of importance and effort at fine language with a negro is apt to display on petty embassies of the kind, he dashed over the brook and was seen scampering away upon the hallow, full of importance and hurry of his mission. All was now bustle and hubbub in the late, quiet schoolroom. The scholars were hurried through their lessons without stopping at trifles. Those who were nimble skipped over half with impunity, and those who were tardy had a smart application now and then in the rear to quicken their speed or help them over a tall word. Books were flung aside without being put away on the shelves, inkstands were overturned, benches thrown down, and the whole school was turned loose an hour before the usual time, bursting forth like a legion of young imps yelping and racketing about the green in joy at their early emancipation. The gallant Ichabod now spent at least an extra half hour at his toilet, brushing and furbishing up his best and indeed only suit of rusty black and arranging his looks by a bit of broken looking-glass that hung up in the schoolhouse. That he might make his appearance before his mistress in the true style of a cavalier, he borrowed a horse from the farmer with whom he was domiciliating, a choleric old Dutchman of the name of Hans Van Ripper, and thus gallantly mounted, issued forth like a knight-errant in quest of adventures, but it is meet I should, in the true spirit of romantic story, give some account of the looks and equipment of my hero and his steed. The animal he bestrode was a broken-down plow horse that had outlived almost everything but his viciousness. He was gaunt and shaggy, with a ewe neck and a head like a hammer. His rusty mane and tail were tangled and knotted with burrs. One eye had lost its pupil and was glaring and spectral but the other had the gleam of a genuine devil in it. Still, he must have had fire and metal in his day, if we may judge from the name he bore of gunpowder. He had, in fact, been a favorite steed of his master's, the choleric Van Ripper, who was a furious rider and had infused very probably some of his own spirit into the animal. For old and broken down as he looked, there was more of the lurking devil in him than in any young filly in the country. Ichabod was a suitable figure for such a steed. He rode with short stirrups, which brought his knees nearly up to the pommel of the saddle. 
His sharp elbows stuck out like grasshoppers. He carried his whip perpendicularly in his hand like a scepter. And as his horse jogged on, the motion of his arms was not unlike the flapping of a pair of wings. A small wool hat rested on the top of his nose, for so his scanty strip of forehead might be called, and the skirts of his black coat fluttered out almost to the horse's tail. Such was the appearance of Ichabod and his steed, as they shambled out of the gate of Hans Van Ripper, and it was altogether such an apparition as is seldom to be met with in broad daylight. It was, as I have said, a fine autumnal day. The sky was clear and serene, and nature wore that rich and golden livery which we always associate with the idea of abundance. The forests had put on their sober brown and yellow, while some trees of the tenderer kind had been nipped by the frosts into bright, brilliant dyes of orange, purple, and scarlet. Streaming files of wild ducks began to make their appearance high in the air. The bark of the squirrel might be heard from the groves of beech and hickory nuts, and the pensive whistle of the quail at intervals from the neighboring stubble field. The small birds were taking their farewell banquets. In the fullness of their revelry, they fluttered, chirping and frolicking from bush to bush and tree to tree, capricious from the very profusion and variety around them. There was the honest cock-robin, the favorite game of stripling sportsmen, with its loud, querulous tone, and the twittering blackbirds flying in sable clouds, and the golden-winged woodpecker with his crimson crest, his broad black gorget, and splendid plumage, and the cedar bird with its red-tipped wings and yellow-tipped tail and its little Montiero cap of feathers, and the blue jay, that noisy coxcomb with his gay light blue coat and white underclothes, screaming and chattering, nodding and bobbing and bowing and pretending to be on good terms with every songster in the grove. As Ichabod jogged slowly on his way, his eye, ever open to every symptom of culinary abundance, ranged with delight over the treasures of jolly autumn. On all sides he beheld vast store of apples, some hanging in oppressive opulence on the trees, some gathered in baskets and barrels for the market, others heaped up in rich piles for the cider press. Further he beheld great fields of Indian corn with its golden ears peeping from their leafy coverts, and holding out the promise of cakes and hasty pudding. And the yellow pumpkins lying beneath them turning up their fair round bellies to the sun and giving ample prospects of the most luxurious of pies. And anon he passed the fragrant buckwheat fields, breathing the odor of the beehive, and and as he beheld them, soft anticipation stole over his mind of dainty slapjacks well buttered and garnished with honey or treacle by the delicate little dimpled hand of Katrina Van Tassel. Thus, feeding his mind with many sweet thoughts and sugared suppositions, he journeyed along the sides of a range of hills which looked out upon some of the goodliest scenes of the mighty Hudson. The sun gradually wheeled his broad disk down into the west, The wide bosom of the Tappan Zee lay motionless and glassy, except that here and there a gentle undulation waved and prolonged the blue shadow of the distant mountain. A few amber clouds floated in the sky without a breath of air to move them. The horizon was of a fine golden tint changing gradually into a pure apple green, and from that into the deep blue of the midheaven. A slanting ray lingered on the woody crests of the precipices that overhung some parts of the river, giving greater depth to the dark gray and purple of their rocky sides. A sloop was loitering in the distance, dropping slowly down with the tide, her sail hanging uselessly against the mast, and as the reflection of the sky gleamed along the still water, it seemed as if the vessel was suspended in the air. And this ends the third part of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel for the next part of the story. Also, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest.